At times, of course, such optimism could be badly shaken. And at none more so than in 1857 in what all Victorian British called the Indian Mutiny, when, among many other incidents, British civilians were massacred at Kanpur, an event on which journalists, writers, and historians dwelt in those times with almost as much relish as upon the black hole of Calcutta, when many decades before, 127 British captives suffocated to death in an Indian prison. Indeed, the black hole of Calcutta being, became part of a concept, part of vernacular English. One widely used textbook from the 1860s told its readers that during the Kanpur massacre, and here you see one part of it, uh, shrieks were heard and groans, the sound of blows as the savages hewed to death the unresisting women and little children who filled the room. Thrice a hacked and blunted sabre was passed out and a sharp, sharper one received in exchange. Next morning the mutilated bodies were dragged forth and cast into a huge well. And when two days later the avenging English under Havelock reached Kanpur, the blood of the victims still lay on the stone pavement of the hall. Fragments of ladies' and children's dresses soaked in blood were scattered all around. <coughs> the savage British reprisals after the suppression of the rebellion, in which wholesale massacres of Indian civilians were accompanied by the lining up of Indian soldiers in front of cannon and blowing them to pieces, did not, of course, in the view of the British press, belong in the same category. And the Indian mutiny, indeed, inaugurated a period of reorientation in Victorian concepts of race and empire, culminating in the active public and propagandistic promotion of empire and imperialism from the 1870s onwards. The 1850s and 60s administered a series of shocks to Britain's confidence in its international superiority and global mission. The shortcomings of the British military administration in the Crimean War, the Indian Mutiny, the failure of British forces to defeat the Maori in the uh, New Zealand land wars, wars, the stalemate of the Second Ashanti War in West Africa, all bad enough, they paled into insignificance in comparison to the upheavals and generated by Bismarck's war, or wars of German unification culminating in the foundation of 1871 of the German Empire, rightly seen as the conquest of the rest of Germany by the military state of Prussia, as in this cartoon of the King of Prussia at dinner. Uh, he's sort of eating up all the other smaller German states. Mr. Israeli, then leader of the opposition, remarked in the House of Commons, this war represents the German Revolution, a greater political event than the French Revolution of the last century. Not a single principle in the management of our foreign affairs accepted by all statesmen for guidance up to six months ago any longer exists. There is not a diplomatic tradition which has not been swept away. You have a new world, said Disraeli, new influences at work, new and unknown objects and dangers with which to cope, at present involved in that obscurity incident to novelty in such affairs. We used to have discussions in this house about the balance of power. Lord Palmerston, eminently a practical man, trimmed the ship of state and shaped its policy with a view to preserve an equilibrium in Europe. The balance of power, Disraeli concluded, has been entirely destroyed, and the country which suffers most and feels the effects of this great change most is England. 